concepts about uh, the idea of consolation. And um, since we're a little group, so don't hesitate if something is not clear or something is a problem or you have an objection, just say it and we'll discuss it so we, we don't have to wait until quote unquote the end. But at any moment, we can examine um, uh, more or better concepts since actually there's a, there are many concepts that we'll use during this uh, presentation. So, but we don't have to go through, through all of them as a necessity. It's more <clears throat> how to deal with the concepts and deal with them in a better way rather than necessarily um, finishing the list. Right. So, uh, yes, Leila? Yeah, just I created a Google Doc, so I will send it on the Zoom uh, link, on uh, the Zoom conversation right now. So everyone can enter the Google Doc. Okay, fine, fine, fine. Okay. Okay, so uh, the, the, first, uh, the first thing simply about consolation, uh, because it's a word that uh, we use not often thinking what it is, although intuitively we can know. Basically, it comes from Latin, the, actually the English word, which means which means con with and soothe. So the idea of consolation is, is a soothing activity, but done by someone else uh, with. Is a soothing with. Now, is it someone else? Is it with something? It doesn't matter. The idea is that can be with yourself, that consolation is soothing. Now, uh, it's a detail, but at the same time, it's important because it implies that there is something to soothe. Uh, what do you soothe in general? It's something that is painful or irritating something that is creating a very immediate problem. And so maybe you don't solve it. Eh? And actually, I think that's important in the idea of consolation. You're not curing, eh? but you're soothing. So it's, uh, it's something, it's a palliative. It's something like you would take an analgesic, a product that would uh, basically make the pain lighter, less heavy, less painful. And that's a very important aspect of the consolation. When the mommy consoles the child who hurt himself, uh, she does not pretend at that moment to cure. I mean, she can cure, she can do something from a medical standpoint, which would be to cure, but she's not pretending to cure. She just wants to uh, make you feel better thinking mommy's here, for example, and you address the moral aspect yeah, of the pain that maybe if mommy's with you, mommy's holding you, uh, you will feel better. So a consolation has no pretension to cure. It has pretension simply to make the pain lighter uh, to, or make you maybe forget the pain. If one way to make the pain lighter <coughs> is to make you forget the pain, but not to, uh, to make the pain disappear totally, although it could be a regulatory ideal of the consolation would be to make the pain uh, disappear through this action. But it is not, at least when somebody is somebody's worried about death, you console him, you do not pretend in general, although implicitly, it might be something like this. You do not want to make death appear. You don't have a cure against death, but simply you may get, you're going to do something that makes the pain of death lesser. Uh, so consolation is soothing. So two important aspects. First of all, we consider there is a pain. And second, we try to make it less heavy, but not try to cure it. So that's the first important aspect of consolation. Uh, now, uh, 
I would like to address for a minute uh, what is pain for us human beings. Because animals have pain as well. Uh, they, have, they are sensitive beings, sentient beings. They can have pain. But let's put it in a quick way. They don't really have an idea of constellation. Now, we can always find when we deal with animals, especially with more evolved animals, we can always try to find uh, certain types of behavior that might look like uh, a consolation, like motherly consolation for uh, little animals, but that would be a little bit too much to project our own uh, type of behavior. So I propose that we examine what tends to be different uh, between, um, between uh, animals and, and human beings. Uh, and the main point actually is one, is that uh, animals mainly have physical pain, yeah. but we have moral pain. So we do have physical pain as well. We're not deprived <coughs> of physical pain, but beside the physical pain, we have as well moral pain. Now, we might think that uh, moral pain is the fact that moral pain uh, would indicate we have more pain than animals, which in a way is true because we have two kinds of pain, although we will see in consolation that because there's moral pain as well, there is such a thing as consolation. Because there's a moral dimension, there is such a thing of consolation, and often, precisely with consolation, uh, our moral capacity tries to do something about our physical pain and this sort of interaction between a moral being and our physical being where the moral self will be used as a way to compensate for the physical pain, try to alleviate the uh, physical pain. Although on the other side, both pains can accumulate. You can have, for example, a physical pain, you are sick, so you have a physical pain, but you can combine with this the moral pain because you are thinking about the consequences of this physical pain. For example, if it's a strong physical pain, you might think of death. So not only you are suffering physically, but you're suffering morally. But this moral pain, therefore, has some ambiguity. It can be both a cause of pain and a cause of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of soothing. Uh, one thing I would like to say about, uh, actually, uh, about uh, the, 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 the moral pain, um, uh, what is the origin of the moral pain in a, let's call it a metaphysical way? Um, you have two ingredients of moral pain, I think, uh, which are reason and freedom, uh, reason and freedom. Um, well, why reason? Now you have to take reason um, in the in the sense in a wide sense. Like in, in in German, you have two words for, for reason, which is Verstand and Vernunft. Uh, in a, in a, in, a, in in English, you can say that uh, one of them is understanding. Reason as understanding it has to do with logic. It has to do with uh, giving uh, meaning to to, to, to to things through some uh, logical procedure. So reason here is understood very much in the idea of some rational procedure or like analysis, synthesis, right, interpretation. But uh, um, so in that sense, maybe you can claim that it's not really... Uh, uh, it's not really cause of, of, of moral pain, but there is a, a wider concept of reason, which is called Vernunft. Uh, and this reason has, we could say, a, a, di a, a creative dimension. It's reason as our capacity to go beyond ourselves, to go beyond what is in front of us. Uh, it's this reason that involves our creativity, or even imagination in a certain way, uh, although 
you can look at the opposition there can be between reason and imagination, but still uh, there is an imaginative component uh, within a reason, which is what allows us to make great wood of arcs, art, uh, great literature, go on the moon, or whatever it is that human beings invented. And you can say, you can claim that to go on the moon is not simply a product of understanding. And that would be a bit uh, reductionist. The understanding allows us to understand, to, to grasp uh, principles of physics uh, that are tools to go on the moon. But the idea of going to the moon and what's involved in such a project goes beyond uh, mere understanding. And uh, something. So it's a reason in a much a wider sense, wider than often we think of, uh, of, of, of reason, where we tend to think about it, the mere uh, understanding aspect. So why is reason um, a cause of pain? It's precisely because it opens new spaces, uh, where uh, spaces, and as soon as you open something, at the same time, you have a closeness of this space. Uh? Uh, you, have a, you can imagine some project you would like to get involved in. And because uh, you imagine a project you can uh, want to be involved in, uh, you can as well have the disappointment of this project not being possible. And that's in that sense that reason can be uh, the product of, uh, of, 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 of pain. Huh? So, yeah although it might seem strange at first. So reason is can both produce some joy and some pain. And of course, you see then uh, the connection to freedom. Uh, man is free in the sense that he is not totally determined by his immediate being. Animals are born. Uh, they have a place to be. They have a way to be. They have an identity. Uh, all they have to do is to be themselves. But human beings are not satisfied with being themselves. And we're not satisfied with being ourselves precisely because we have freedom. We have the possibility or the freedom to be not ourselves. In fact, that's what uh, parents tell the child or ask the child when he's small, what do you want to be when you grow up? Uh, we don't imagine parent tiger parents asking their baby tiger, what do you want to be when you are big? <laughs> You'll just be a tiger. The, the, the dice are cast. It's a, it's a given. But we ask our children and we ask ourselves, what will I be? It's not simply what will I do with the expression. Often the advantage of words, if we listen to them uh, uh, closer, uh, say things in a very speaking way. We don't ask the child, we can ask the child, what do you want to do when you grow up? But we can ask him, what do you want to be uh, when you grow up? And the deciding what you're going to be is an important uh, aspect of the human being. Uh, and for example, the idea of uh, bad faith of Sartre is precisely people that are not uh, accepting this human dimension, this free human dimension, where uh, we decide who we are, we decide uh, what we will be, and we will construct our existence, but we pretend uh, in a way like animals or things are done, that we don't have to decide, that everything is already decided. And I think at that point we're uh, cowardly, uh, trying not to see uh, that freedom. But of course, there's a reason why we prefer that things are given. There's a reason why we prefer not to think about what we could be. Because it's painful. It can be painful because it's not uh, coming quick or it's not coming at all or, or it will never come. Uh, if I want to be Batman uh, at a certain age, I can tell. I can dream about it when I'm a child, think maybe, but at a certain age, you have to give up on what you uh, would have liked to be or want to be. Uh, 
and there's some kind of a disappointment. Yeah. So the idea then the two concepts huh, to, to, to finish on the little part that uh, create pain in uh, the human being is for one reason and for one and the other freedom, although they're not uh, radically distinct one from the other, because in a way, reason it what gives you that freedom, but still uh, there are two uh, different concepts, although they are, they are being uh, related, uh, related. So uh, I've already outlined it a little bit while speaking about freedom and reason, but um, what are the causes of this moral pain uh, which in human being? Well, I would say basically there are three uh, forms of pain. Uh, one you can call worrying or fear, uh, worrying or fear. Uh, because we have freedom and reason, we can uh, think about the future. And we can think, of course, about the future as a, a, a great place where all kind of wonderful things will happen. But I would say naturally, and even often in a way that's not natural because it happens in excess, we have worries of fear uh, because so many things can happen. Uh, you can go in the street and at any moment uh, a car can run you over. Uh, uh, when you, every day in life, you can think that uh, robbers will come in your house and steal what you have. Uh, you can think that your uh, spouse will betray you. You can think that your children will die. Because we have reason, we have an immense capacity of of inventing of making horror movies you know uh, and often uh, notice that uh, people replace uh, reason uh, or thinking by worrying worrying is a very popular activity uh, for for human beings to the extent that they easily uh, replace uh, thinking by, by, by worrying, uh, to have a fear that comes with it. And basically, what does it mean to worry? It means to think primarily about the bad things that could happen. First of all, think primarily about bad things that could happen. And second, to overestimate. And in that sense, it is a bit counter to reason. It's not rational or not reasonable to overplay or overestimate the bad things that could happen, right? And therefore create fear in our heart. So worrying and fear is the first uh, main cause of, uh, of uh, the first main cause of, uh, of pain. The second main cause of pain, and we've seen it but I, again, want to make uh, here a clear, distinguished concept with it, is, uh, is a desire, uh, desire or expectation. Right? It comes to the same thing. Um, because we have freedom and reason, of course, animals have desire too. Uh, they, they want to satisfy their needs. Uh, and they want to satisfy their biological needs but their desires, expectations are limited to satisfying immediate uh, biological needs. Uh, they want to feed themselves, they want to protect themselves through some home or whatever they use to protect themselves, or, or uh, they, they, they want to reproduce, uh, basically the three uh, basic needs that animals have, uh, feed themselves, protect themselves, and reproduce. But because we have reason and freedom, uh, we have many more needs uh, that, that uh, uh, we, we invent uh, or we learn. A very simple one is uh, our image, our reputation, the way we are perceived, the, the judgment of uh, the surrounding, 
uh, we, we have a strong desire to have a good image, a, a nice image. Uh, or you want to be loved, or we want to have power, or we want to have fame. So we, we construct uh, those, those expectations. Now, at the same time, I don't want to simply give a negative idea about desires and expectations because, and that's the whole uh, point of, uh, of, of human existence, that those desires and expectations at the same time construct us. And they construct us and they make who we are. So they're at the same time uh, some kind of, uh, of, of necessity yeah, that we, in our being. Yeah. Although the Buddhists have an interesting distinction they make between uh, desire and, and, uh, and thirst, which basically could be between desire and need. Yeah. To have desire can be a motivation, can be an incentive. You want to get something. Uh, the question is when this desire become a need and then uh, it becomes painful because it's a form of addiction. Uh, you don't think you can live without it. So you lose your freedom. You lose the necessary distance and then you start believing that your life is impossible without this particular desire. Uh, for example, I need to be recognized. And you might construct something very excessive where you think something is such a need that if you don't have it, you suffer. So you create uh, this, this, this suffering. So the idea of, uh, of uh, desire and expectation uh, is something that both is uh, a component of human existence, but because as well, it is, uh, it produces pain uh, in, in us because we are not, we, we don't have it. And the third one, the third concept uh, comes, derives uh, from this, which is frustration and disappointment. Uh -huh. The main difference between uh, frustration and disappointment is more something uh, temporal. Frustration is I'm not getting it or I'm not getting it quick enough, yeah, it's, uh, it's, but it's still some hope of, of, of getting it. Disappointment is more like it's finished, that's it. You, you, you didn't get it. Yeah, it's, a, it's a past, so it's a, uh, there, there's no hope anymore or you don't think you can get it anymore. Yeah, it's too late. So it's a uh, disappointment is I wanted something, I did not get it. When frustration is more, I, I am not getting it yet or not getting it quick enough. Uh, the other one, no, the, the, the game is game over. I did not get it. Right? So basically the most pain of human being is organized around these, uh, these uh, three concepts. Uh, we, we worry, we have fear. Uh, what could happen, we want something to happen, uh, we expect something to happen, uh, and uh, it is not happening or not happening quick enough and we're disappointed. If you look at most of the moral pain uh, in human beings, it rotates around these three, uh, these three, uh, these, these, these concepts. And all the, the sad passions that Spinoza speaks about, which deprive us of our of being, which uh, limit our power of being, are very connected to that. Uh, for example, uh, sadness, shame, it's just different, or anger, uh, it's just different formulation, different emotional colors of this problem. For example, power, uh, sorry, uh, anger, I want something very strongly, yes, so I have this, this desire, but I have the frustration because I feel powerless uh, to get it. So I get angry. I could get sad. The sides of the same coin. You're sad because you're depressed, it, and, and anger is the manic aspect of it. So people who are uh, into these modes, uh, sadness and anger are two different modalities 
of the same of the same issue. Right? So shame is the uh, social dimension of something that you would like to be, but you cannot be, and society tells you you are not that, and therefore you are not good. But it's just a more complex construction of uh, desire and the disappointment of not getting that desire through social consideration of this uh, of this uh, of this uh, desire and the frustration of it. Huh? Same with with envy. Envy. I want something. Uh, motivated by the fact other people have it. So again, it's another combination of desire and uh, social uh, and social life. But basically, you can reduce any problem to this three concept, uh, uh, worries, expectation, and uh, frustration, disappointment. Right. Right. Uh, now, the only thing as well is that uh, desire uh, is something that we do not control, we do not master. It's, uh, because we are free, our desire is infinite. And in that sense, uh, one can have a desire that is infinite because even when it makes object, it can make new object. There's an infinite power of representation of, of desire. Now, the interesting thing again with the human being is that here I described it in a, let's call it a rather uh, negative way. But as well, this infinite desire can be the infinity of an ideal I would like to reach, a regulatory ideal, like, for example, to be moral. To be moral as a pure morality is an impossibility because necessarily because of the reality of the self, the reality of the world, uh, you will never reach this total uh, morality. And same with the idea of the, of the divine or transcendence. Uh, we, we fabricate uh, some primary reality, like God, for example, and uh, which is the power of our reason. But as a byproduct, as a feedback from the production of this, uh, of this uh, ideal, uh, we will see how little we are, how unsatisfying our existence is, and therefore how we can view yourself as being very miserable, very little, very insignificant. Uh -huh. So we see all the time that there's this back and forth between the power we have of fabricating something uh, big, beautiful, infinite, and at the same time, because of this, not be on the level, uh, not be what we should be in relation to this, uh, to this uh, fabrication. And because of this, um, we have an important concept, which is called the fracture of being. The fracture of being is basically a tension between what we are and what we would like to be, uh, between some immediate self uh, or, or being in itself and the being for itself, what our conscience or our consciousness would like you, us to be able to be, a sort of tension between uh, finite and infinite. Uh, and that's often both, again, what allows us to exist, what makes us be, what creates existence, what gives us a drive uh, to, 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 to be, uh, in a, because the human uh, life is something you have to constitute, uh, but at the same time, the pain that can derive from this desire to exist. Uh. So these are, are basically, uh, that was a description of the pain. Uh, I, I have finished that part about describing human pain uh, because unless you understand the pain, you cannot understand the consolation, right? 
so you're first to, to, to see the pain. So, so I'm going to start now going through the different forms of, a, of consolation. Uh, but before I go on the, the different form of consolation, I don't know if someone has a, an, a question or a comment or something about uh, what I said about the causes of, of human pain. If that's the case, just, just, just say it or everything is fine with you, no? Okay, or you're sitting down comfortably. Yes, uh, Luca, go ahead. Well, I have a question. Something is not clear. When you were describing in the last uh, two minutes the, the fracture of the self, you were talking about the, the, the being in itself and the being for itself. But, uh, I don't understand this. Uh, maybe I missed something, I don't know. Well, the, 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 the being in itself, it's a, it's a distinction that uh, you find in uh, German critical philosophy <clears throat> is the idea that you are what you are in yourself. Yes. And uh, like an object, you define yourself as an object. Yeah. Uh, and the idea of being for itself, that means you have the doubling of the being. He has a relationship to himself. Generally, it implies the way it's used. It implies consciousness. Uh, it implies that you can be two. There's you, there's the I, and the me, right? The being in itself, actually, there's no I. There's just a me. There's a product. Me is the, is the object, yeah? And you, and you speak about me, it's like you speak about him. It's a pure object. And that's sometimes people describe it this way. There is me. That, that's it. That's the way I am. And when you introduce a subject, you introduce the I. Yeah? There's no subject in the me. Me is an object. A subject, in fact, the child, uh, initially, since you have a, a baby, well, maybe, I don't know, he doesn't speak enough yet, but he'll speak himself in the third person. He'll say, uh, you know, uh, Johnny wants. And when he grows up, he'll learn to say I. I I mean, of course, there's already uh, an intuition or, a, of, or a, 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 a human being of, of some kind of thing of the I. But to, to say I, to, to use the word I, implies that you determine yourself as a subject, and therefore, as a subject, you're the cause of something. A subject is a cause. Yeah? So you're a cause of the action. So if you're only an object, you are, that's, what, that's all. And when you introduce the I, you introduce a, a dialectical relationship between the I as a subject and me as an object. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thanks. Something else? No? Oh, yes, Isabel? Uh, yes, at one moment you bring the idea of bad faith by Sartre, but I didn't make the link with the consolation. Well, right now I was not in consolation, I was in pain. Consolation okay, is so coming. You're going to have to suffer a bit more because before you have consolation, I was describing the pain precisely to, to echo what I was telling Luca. <clears throat> when you say, for example, uh, I am a professor, that's me. You describe yourself as a me, you're not a subject. Huh? You are a product, and that product is who I am. And uh, there's no subject, so there's no freedom. And Sartre says that's bad faith because you eliminate the subject, you eliminate the transcendence of the me, which is the I, and the I is free. The idea could decide that you're something else than a professor. So in a way, you're not a professor. You act as a professor at a given moment, but there is a dimension of yourself that is outside, that transcends this professor. So the bad faith, the bad faith is pretended, pretending that I am me, yeah? And not make this disassociation between the I and the me that is necessary to construct deliberately, willfully your own existence. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. All right. You understand? I understand. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Good. Yeah. Anything else? No. Good. Okay. So now, uh, what I will now go do is go through different forms of consolation uh, that uh, we make up as a human uh, species, make up for ourselves. Uh, identified about 19 uh, types of, of consolation. Yes, okay. Uh, the first one is the hope. Uh, uh, you know, when you tell people you have a problem, uh, sometimes they tell you it will be better. And, and in fact, they even predict to you everything will be fine which is very ambitious. Some people say, everything will be fine, which is obvious it's wishful thinking, but for some reason it must work because we do say such thing. Uh, everything will be fine. So here uh, is the idea of a future. That's a very undetermined future because we're not telling you why. I mean, you could say it will be fine because, uh, it will be better because. But if you notice, very often, there is no because. It's just a pure act of faith. And why not? Huh? I mean, it's not forbidden. I mean, you can think that in the future, everything will be worse. If you're a warrior, you think the future is a cause of terrible things. And then you think that the future will uh, prove that uh, you are right, that life is a horror movie. Why not? So that's... I, I describe that as a cause of pain. But nothing stops you from thinking on the opposite, that the future will be, provide you with, uh, uh, with an avenue of roses. Huh? Would be, the future will be great. In French, we have an expression, les lendemains qui chantent, the tomorrows that sing. <laughs> so it's a freedom. And since it's a pure act of faith, I mean, faith, you, you, you decide what you want to believe in a way. Huh? And why not? I mean, to, to think that tomorrow everything will be fine is a very nice, I mean, you can laugh at it, say, oh, this is ridiculous. This, this is, there is no, no, no particular no, no, no reason to, 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 to think so. But don't forget the consolation is not about curing. It's about alleviating the pain. So if you have pain and you want to believe that you have a disease, that tomorrow you'll be better, why not? Uh, it, it, nothing. So in all this, you can be critical because it doesn't fit reason, but it works. Uh, like kicking your car to make it function, and why not? Uh, so anyway, so the, 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 the future, uh, the hope, uh, because the, the real name of it is hope, uh, is a typical kind of a, the consolation, a very common one, yes, consolation through the future. So each time I will move to, before I move to the next one, I'll check if there's any problem, because I'm going to move to the next one. So any problem with the future as consolation? Okay, fine. So let's go on. Now, as a purely logical, uh, logical move, if the future can be a consolation, you have its counterpart, the past as consolation. Now, uh, if some people, the future cannot be a consolation, they have the past. This is called nostalgia. Uh, now, I know some people, for some people, they, they just don't get it. Like future people, I call them the anxious people, the people who want to project in the future, they have a hard time understanding how nostalgia uh, can be a consolation. But for a number of people, in fact, uh, you have this when you hear your grandfather or retired people or old people uh, who, who have. They say, now life is not so good. You know, I have my arthritis. You know, I cannot do what I want anymore. I feel lonely. Uh, my future looks a bit bleak. Yeah, but when I was young, you know, when I was in the army, when I was a child, with my grandmother by the river making me apple pie, how things were wonderful. Uh, you can call it a form of intoxication, but it can console you, and why not? 
there's an idea of a cart which says that what you have lived, what you have gone through in the past, uh, never leaves you, right? So if you have known a great moment, a great love story in your past, and in fact, we see this with love stories, people still remember that great love story. Then there's a question, how do you use it? Do you use that great love story to show how bad it is now and how you don't have this great love story anymore? But you can use it in the reverse to say, that great love story is still here. Uh, I had this great love moment when I was a teenager. And, uh, you know, or, or there was a moment of glory in your life. You got Nobel Prize, you know, a few years ago. Now, no more this year, but you got it. So you put it in your, uh, you put this Nobel Prize in your living room. And you can say, I am happy because I had this great moment in my life. And this great moment is here forever. Uh, you live out of your past glories. So I hope with all these different examples, people reconcile with the idea of nostalgia. Uh, and this no nostalgia can be legitimate. If you've done something good in your past and you, you have good memory of it, why not uh, think this is the culmination of your existence, this is a symbol of your existence, this is the climax of your existence, and it can, uh, you know, when you retire in France, uh, they, 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 they calculate your retirement on the basis of the best earning you had in, uh, in your life. You can do the same and say, and think the meaning of your life or the value of your life is determined by the best uh, years of your life and think that that's what makes it. Why not? Okay, so that's the idea. Of, uh, that's the idea of, uh, of consolation. As, uh, so even though you're suffering because of your physical condition, you can, uh, you can console yourself through this nostalgia. So um, I finished with nostalgia. So does anybody have a problem with nostalgia uh, before I move to the next? Yes, Isabel, you're not nostalgic. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> no. Yeah, I'm seeing based on what you said, how nostalgia can be consolation because usually nost people who are in nostalgia, they are more in regrets. So how regrets, can it be a consolation? Okay, well, let, let me see. So I don't do all the work. Does somebody want to, to answer Isabel on this problem? of the relationship between nostalgia and regret. Does anybody want to deal with it? You raise your hand. Okay, all right. Okay, Marius, go ahead. Uh, I see the regrets as the form of pain. So the cause of the regrets causing the pain uh, that goes before then uh, the the consolation. Then you come up with all those reasons that yeah, I've been good, I've been a good soldier in the war, I've been whatever. And with that one, you start, you try to to uh, deal with the regrets. Yeah, but how, how how do you articulate here the regret and the and the positive side of nostalgia? How do you make them work together? Or do you oppose them? Uh, I, I equate the regrets with the pain. That would be the cause of the... Of the um, yeah, okay, of, but suppose I was great uh, 10 years ago. I, yeah. uh, I'm not, that implies I'm not great anymore, right? Correct. So that's what Isabel calls regret. I am not great anymore. I was great 10 years ago, right? Agree. Okay. And Indeed. nostalgia is to say, oh, I was great 10 years ago, and I'm happy of this. So what's the difference of dynamic? Can you say? Well, then I don't see necessarily the, the way it oh. connects the regret with, with creating a pleasurable uh, 
vulnerable uh, feeling. Okay, Leila, you want to try it? Um, yes, well, uh, you can find some comfort by thinking about the past that can make you deal better with what's happening in the present. Okay, but what's the relationship with regret? What's the dynamic between them? Well, if you regret something, it means that at, was, at one point it was good. Yeah, but regret is about now. I don't have any more, right? Yeah. Okay, so how do you articulate the regret? How does it work, the dynamic regret? Because Isabel is saying, well, when you don't have any more, you have regret. So how does this nostalgia function? You don't know. Uh, well, I, because I distinguish nostalgia from regret. Yeah, I think everybody does. Oh, okay. The question is, they have something in common. It's the relationship to the past, right? Yes, yes, yes. So how do you articulate them together? You put them together, you oppose them. How do you do it? Uh, no, I rather oppose them. Okay, what's the difference? Uh, yes, well, uh, regret is the connection between the past and the present. You wish that the past was happening now. Okay. And in nostalgia, it only focuses on the present, on, uh, on the past, sorry. So okay. there is no connection to the present. There is no connection to the present. But at the same time, you are in the present when you have nostalgia, right? Yes. So yes. what happens with the present when you're in nostalgia? Um... You think about the previous good times. Yes. So, yeah, so it's more, it's, I would say it's more something passive. Well, regret is more active. In nostalgia, yeah. it's more passive. Well, do you think it comes by itself to think of as nostalgia or you have to do something? You have to think. You just have to think. Okay. Anybody else has an intuition on that? Uh, yes. Hello, this is Miranda. Who? Well, Miranda. Uh, uh, yes, I wait, wait, somehow logged in with on, some hold, ID. Hold on a second. Uh, uh, are, are you a person that doesn't show herself? Yes. Can you show yourself? I don't think that's possible. Let me one second. And and as well, are you A F one six zero eight nine? That sounds like a. I wonder. I was wondering if it was a robot. <laughs> no, it's one okay. second. Okay, that's that's. I better. have something put, on my camera, but it's fine. It's fine. And put, can you put a name that doesn't look like a, a robot? You know how I don't you, know how. No. You go on participants. You will see your name, and then you will see. You can do renaming. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. mm -hmm. You see. Yeah, that's, that's better. And where where are you, Smaranda? Uh, in Romania. In Romania. Okay, mm -hmm. fine. So now we listen to you. We have a real human being. So to speak about <laughs> regret. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. So I have a guess here about the regrets. Um, since we initiated the discussion now with my uh, identity and my name, uh, now I regret that I didn't put this uh, from the beginning. So I think that regrets can be um, amended in the future or in the present. You regret something from the past and you acknowledge that and you can change that now. You cannot, right? You can. You can. You can in similar situations uh, based on okay. past experiences. Wait, I, I, I don't understand. When you have regret mm -hmm. about what happened in the past, can you change the past or no? You cannot change the past, no. but you... Wait, wait, uh, smile on no. There's no rush. Don't worry. I know time is money, but here, no. It's, it's, it's fine, okay? So let's go slowly, okay? So, you agree? You cannot change it. It's done, right? Yep. So, your regret is, is you say, I didn't do this. I should have done it. Something like that, right? Correct. Okay. So, what's the difference between this and nostalgia? Or what happens? What's the difference between them? I think that from regrets, you can change something in the 
present experiences or in okay. the future experiences. But if you do, we're not in nostalgia anymore. You are into changing the present, you see? So you're not relating to nostalgia anymore. You're into doing something in the present. When nostalgia doesn't do that. So you, you, you're discussing something else. You notice? Yes, but we then the this relationship. We don't want a relationship between regret and having no regrets, but the, the, the relationship between regret and nostalgia. But if you do something, you're doing something in the present, that's something else. Do you, do you understand why? Yes, but well, in no, this case, no. no. Are you always in a rush like that? Yes. Yes, no, don't because see, for thinking, if you want to pass the vacuum cleaner or things like this or cook, that's fine. But not, or not even cooking, but shopping. But not here, see? Because it seems to me you're not dealing with the issue, which is relationship between nostalgia and regret. You're going on something else, which is doing something now. But here, no, we're simply in thought, uh, in thought, uh, uh, thought experiment, yeah? Do you understand what I'm saying or no? I think I understand. You are asking about the relationship between the regrets and the nostalgia. Okay, go ahead. And both are related to something in the past, to the past. So far, so good. Okay, but nostalgia, it's something that you are not thinking that can be changed. Well, no, because you like it. It's good. Nostalgia here, I use it as a positive thing. Something great happened to me 10 years ago. I had a great love story, so I don't want to change it. It's, I have a good memory from it. But if you have regrets about the past love story, that you can change. What? You mean I'm going to do something else now? Yes, or uh, the regret itself. You okay, how, how do I change the regret? How do I do this? By finding different uh, reasons for what happened and then you don't regret it anymore. Okay, but then you rationalize. You give reasons. You give reasons for what you regret, yeah? You rationalize it. Correct. Yeah, but then it's not nostalgia. You are started to reason. You're speaking but, about uh, something else. Okay. Yes, Sorry. but I'm not. Why, Smarana? The problem is you, you go too quick. And so each time you shift away from the specific problem. Do you notice or no? Okay, visibly not. Well, look, Smaranda, do you think I am wrong when I tell you that you shift away from the focus? Do you think I'm wrong or right? Okay, you think I'm wrong, fine. Okay, who thinks Maranda uh, is focused on exactly the problem? Raise your hand. So raise your hands, Maranda, because you think you are. Well, raise your hand, don't worry, it's, it's part of, okay. Who thinks Maranda is not focusing on the problem? Raise your hand. Okay, you see the hands up, Maranda? Yeah? Now, do you think it's a plot against you because they're my friends or something, or you think it's real? I think it's real, but let's okay, see. Right, don't, don't, no, but don't, don't say but. Don't. Just fine. Just, just. See, if you want to come here, work with us, see, you have to learn. I'm sure you're, you're very opinionated. I'm sure you have arguments. I'm sure you like fighting with people and, and get your arguments through. But here, no, that's not our job. Our job is to ensure we're focused, okay? Huh? But don't worry. It's okay. It's the first time you come. I think I've never seen it before. It will come. Don't worry. But just patience, right? Okay? You patient? Okay. Are you patient? Yes, I'm patient now. Ah, now, yes. Okay. <laughs> we'll see. Okay, fine. All right. So let me propose then to move on with this. Is that what I propose to you? Uh, uh, see, your past, you decide what you can look at in your past. And all of us, we have things we can regret and we have things that we can enjoy, right? And that's a choice, a choice, or you can tell me you're determined. So uh, some people decide they, they, they want more than what they've had. The people that want more than what they had, 
they are in the regrets because they didn't get it. Okay? The people that rather make a choice of being fine with themselves and not wanting so much, they're going to make the choice of nostalgia because we all have things in our past we can be happy about and things we can be not happy about. So it's a choice of what you're going to focus on. You want to focus on what you didn't get and maybe as Miranda said, you're going to try to get it now or you want to focus on what you had and you want to maintain forever this thing that you had because you think it's great, beautiful, it makes you happy. Does that answer your question, Isabel? Okay, I get the point, yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, Leila, are so you smoking or raising your... Oh, sorry, you finished, Isabel? Uh, yeah, just so if I get your point, it's how finally you, you deal with it. It's, no, it's, it's not how you deal with it. It's what you relate to. What you relate to, okay. Yeah. Or, right. or how you relate to your past, you see? Okay, huh? all right, no. yeah. Okay. You decide and don't decide because some people that want a lot from their life, they'll have a hard time uh, being nostalgic because they're more, uh, they're still worried about the future. Nostalgic people are saying, you know, it doesn't matter what happens now. I have this great thing and I'm happy with it, yeah? So I'll sit by the lake and remember the good old days. Yeah? So they, they want nothing more. Yeah? But if you like want something, they'll be in regret because, they, oh my God, I could have got that and I didn't get it. And either they feel frustrated or they are going to try to get it now. Okay. Yeah. Get it? Okay. Yeah? Now, yeah. Uh, you can decide that or not decide. I leave that to each one. Uh, because if you're in the regret, it's hard to be nostalgic. So how much it's natural, how much you can do something about it. But it's what you choose to look at. Okay. Good? Yeah. Okay. All, right. All right. It's good, yeah. Or it's how you decide yeah. to think of the past. We're good? Yeah, okay. yeah it's right. good, yeah. Good. You okay with that, Smaranda? Yes, I'm okay. All right, good. Okay. So... Uh, no, nothing else but nostalgia? No? We're good? Okay, we're going to move to the next concept. But I warned you, you see, it goes slow, but it doesn't matter. We, looked, we won't look at all the concepts. Okay. The third one, I call it inscription in reality. Inscription in reality. Uh, now, it might be a bit abstract, but each time I'm going to find you uh, a way, uh, a common way, by which uh, we use that, mommy uses that, or daddy or the friends use that, you know? For example, uh, somebody has a, a love drama, right? And uh, you, and that person, you say, oh my God, it's terrible. And what do we tell them? We say, that's life, huh? or huh? that's love, that's life, right? This, well, what can you do? And we console people by saying, Look, it's reality, or you're going to die. Well, my friend, everything dies, right? We have these, uh, we have this quick-made uh, philosophical remark. It's not false. Huh? It can be used a bit in a cheap way, but which basically we say that's the way things are, right? Uh, now, uh, the idea that's the way things are, of course, it doesn't cure, but I said earlier that the function of consolation, not to cure, but uh, make you feel better. But of course, if that's the way life is, I mean, you can feel better about it because it means everybody has it. And already, if everybody has it, you feel a bit better. It means you could not have done anything about it because everybody is bound to have a love drama. Uh, nobody ever, I think, I might be wrong, but had love without some kind of drama in love. So you cannot avoid it. And if you cannot avoid it, you cannot suffer, you might still suffer, but you're supposed to suffer less because it was unavoidable. And that's what I call inscription in reality. Anybody has a question about inscription in reality? Or that one is no problem. Okay. Fine, so let's move on. Yeah. Uh, 
Okay. Fourth one is modify expectatives. Yes. Yeah? Or modify your, uh, your desires. Yeah? When uh, somebody suffers because he doesn't get what he wants, the typical way is by saying, well, maybe you should give up on wanting that. Maybe you, maybe you want too much. Eh? Maybe you think too much about what you want, right? So the idea is to modify your desire. It's sort of, again, you know, you find this in some basic uh, wisdom. You say, you're making yourself unhappy by having all these desires and expectations. If you modify your desire and expectation, you will suffer less. So here you go at the root of the pain which is the fact that you, as we described at the beginning, is because you expect that you suffer, expect less, you will suffer less. In a way, you can say in a quick way that without expectation, there would be no suffering. I mean, I'm speaking, of course, the moral dimension of suffering. If you have no expectation, you will not suffer. But of course, you'll tell me that it's impossible not to have expectation if this expectation is only to catch the bus uh, that I, I want to catch to go to work in the morning, yeah? So, modify expectation as consolation. That one, I think, is easy, but still, anybody has a problem with it? Or it gives you some idea about it? No? Fine. Does it inspire you? Yeah, it's not the most exciting one, but it's still uh, real. Okay, fourth. Fourth, fifth, is giving meaning. You want to say something, Lara? Yeah? About uh, modifying desires. I yeah. think in Moscow it doesn't work because uh, we are very greedy here. Business people are very right. greedy. Yeah, then um, it won't work with them. Yeah. Well, it, it, well, it won't work. I, I think it, it, it can work. Now, these constellations never work necessarily. Huh? Uh, it, 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 it can work, that's all. Huh? Actually, when, we, when you do a consultation, or when you speak to a friend, you try to find which consolation uh, might work. Of course, if you're discussing with your greedy businessman and tell him to modify expectation because that makes him suffer, okay, maybe it's not going to work. And maybe if he's getting old and tired, maybe he will learn he should, in fact, give up. I don't know. But indeed, maybe you will have to find uh, something else, yeah? But never think of a consolation as uh, something that works absolutely and necessarily. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. different type of consolation that works. Uh, there was one uh, I will use later on for your Moscow businessmen. What they like to do is they do sport. See, they use their body. Mm -hmm. That's a way to console themselves. I'll have this as one of the further consolation. And they do it naturally. They will do sport. And you ask them, why do you do so much sport? And they like to do sport. is because I stop thinking. And what do they mean by stop thinking is I stop worrying. And why do I mean by stop worrying? I mean I stop having all this expectation and frustration in my mind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. sports... Uh, or drinking yeah, as well, uh, functions rather well, might be a better way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Okay. Or running, jogging. Yeah. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of people do sports for that, to stop thinking, which means to stop worrying. All right. But anyway, but any, any uh, consolation you have can work within a certain context and to a certain extent, not as an absolute. Huh? Yeah, Marius? Uh, comment about the how the if the constellation work actually many times they work the other way around and make the person even more angry when you propose like change your expectations or tell yeah. them you're gonna die yes and many times they work just the other way around so yeah constellation it, as you said it's not a, a, a way to to resolve the problem but a proposition right which might turn as I said uh, the opposite. Do you know uh, why it's interesting uh, your remark that it might work the opposite? And we see this sometimes we try to console someone and we tell them something, they get angry about this consolation or, or we 
uh, somebody console this, we find it very irritating. Have you noticed why certain can create irritation of anger in a person? Did you, did you notice why? Well, might be a few reasons. One of them is that maybe they don't get uh, their attention, they, they cannot victimize uh, and uh, become victims, therefore they, they okay. don't get what, what they want, the attention. Uh, otherwise... But, uh, can, you, can, uh, can, can you say something yeah. specific about the type of consolation? Why certain... Yeah, the general thing is people want to stay victim, but uh, why certain specific consolations create aversive reactions, do you know? Maybe it comes as uh, as uh, um, sort of a confirmation of something they don't want. Uh, they they had an intuition, but they didn't want to hear. Right. Uh, yes. For example, suppose you have a, a bad business venture, and I come and I pat you on the head. Say, Marius, everything will be fine. Would you be happy at me? It's not allowed to show you the finger. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but what, just I, I know yeah, it's, a, it's an absurd example. Out. But why would that make you unhappy? I imagine it would make you unhappy. Why? Uh, well, there is irony uh, in okay, it. So it no, might be irony. That might be, okay, that might suppose, be, uh, Maria. Suppose it's real. I, I, I'm doing it for yeah. real. On your mother, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm your mother. No irony. Mothers don't do irony, but I go. I say, Marius, everything will be fine. Why would that one bother you, for example? Well, it would be a confirmation that, well, I'm quite bad. Okay, exactly. Uh, see, and that's a classical one. Uh, 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 um, cons uh, when we have pain, because we have the end, we're bad. So anything, any sign given to you, which in your representation would show you're bad, works exactly counter to the consolation. And that's why... Many people don't understand why their consolation. It confirms in the person the fact is not good, which is the cause of, of the pain. Yes. Okay. Yeah. You want to add something? No. no. Okay. okay. Lara, you want to say something? Uh, yes, I wanted to propose that uh, uh, when we say to console so, uh, somebody, uh, we say that he is impotent or he cannot change anything by this. For example. Right. Yes. If, change your desires or everything will be okay? Can it change? Well, everything will be okay doesn't tell you you're impotent because everything will be okay is a promise that things will go the way you want. So you're not declared impotent. Okay, yeah, here no, but yeah, yeah. So but, uh, the, the example before when you mother someone, uh, given the feeling uh, you know, that he's, he's being mothers, so feeling that he's impotent, then he might get upset, yeah? Mm -hmm. I guess, yeah, it depends the way you say everything will be okay. If you look like you're behaving like someone's mom, mm -hmm. yes, indeed, indeed, yeah. All right. You're good? Yeah. Okay, fine. All right, so let's move on to the next one, give meaning, uh, give meaning. Okay, that one's a little bit more subtle. Uh, but uh, one way we deal with our pain is by giving meaning to that pain. Uh, I'll give you a classical example, which is in a religious context, where, for example, uh, um, you know, somebody's suffering, but it's going to say that's our function in life, to suffer, and afterwards we go to paradise. So, okay, there's a future dimension, but still uh, the meaning of the suffering is expiation of our sins. Uh, it means to expiate our sins. And if, if my suffering is to expiate my sins, therefore, that's it. Or same, uh, uh, I did something wrong and I, 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 I suffer from it. And I can say it's punishment. Punishment is a way of meaning because the punishment goes with uh, fault. Uh? And by viewing something as a punishment, therefore I give meaning to my pain because it comes together 
with something I have done that is wrong. Don't forget meaning, the, the meaning of meaning, if I may say, is connection, is to connect. So by giving meaning to something, you find connection to something else. So something that looks meaningless, it's painful because it's, it's meaningless because it has no connection to anything. But if I connect it to something else, then it has meaning and then it is less painful. Any, anything about uh, giving meaning as consolation? Yes, Isabel. Can you say as well, like uh, if you say, uh, yeah, it shows that I'm a, a human being because I see so many people acting in a very bad way. So by, uh, by suffering, it gives meaning and it's kind of... Yeah, so, but here you are a little bit uh, it's going back into inscription of reality. But it's true that giving meaning an inscription in reality, when you say it's human, yes, okay. I mean, they, they sort of overlap, an inscription in reality and give it meaning. But here, that one here, it's human, it's more like, well, that's, that's human being. But okay, it's still giving meaning at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else? No? We're good? Okay, fine. Uh, by the way, these consolations that I'm giving, yes, they're not clear-cut, uh, distinct. Uh, uh, you know, they, they, they can overlap. Uh, There's just different angles uh, to look at things, but they might overlap, like in this case here. It's the overlapping of inscription and reality and giving meaning, and it's true. They have something in uh, in. Uh, in, in common. The thing that, that might be a uh, distinction in reality has a broader, more universal kind of, that's the way it is, but meaning as a more specific, uh, private or particular, uh, particular uh, 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 sense, yes. Okay, fine. Okay, so uh, next one is put words, put words. Yeah? Uh, words, uh, language, being a form of writing, of speaking, uh, is a, an important form of consolation. Uh, we find this, for example, in the complaint. Why we like to complain of pain, it starts with just simply say, ouch, uh, to saying, to going to uh, someone you know, close to you, say, oh my God, I hurt myself, or wow, this guy at work, he was horrible with me, and you alleviate, uh, you alleviate the pain by speaking. In fact, uh, the, 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 one of the first way to call psychoanalysis was called the talking cure, yeah, the talking cure. Yeah? So speech is an important form, uh, or writing, uh, if, you, if you write poetry or your diary, and you say all the bad things happening to you, uh, in a way, confession has something similar, or going to a bar with friends, uh, speech, putting words on things, has a cathartic effect. It's sort of a purge upon uh, the pain that you might have. So putting words, uh, using words. Anything about that? No? No come. Yes, Marius. Actually, uh, it sounds very much like giving meaning because uh, by putting words, you you, you just convert a, a sort of pre-thought into into a, a real thought. You, you you give it a almost a meaning, as you said, because without yeah. words, it, it almost but, remains as a as a pre-thought. But do you see? Uh, some moments where I use words, but it's not about meanings. Do you, do you see or no? Uh, yes, when even it's possible that you have it already clear and you just verbalize it. Okay. No, what you can say words and it's not about meaning at all. For example, I give you the example of ouch. When I say, ouch, uh, why is thing 
intuitively, we're going to say something, yeah? But a little bit more sophisticated, I'm going to say, uh, I suffer because somebody uh, uh, hit me, and I'm going to tell, I'm not, ex I'm not giving meaning, I'm only describing what happened, right? So yes, meaning can be a form of putting words, and it, it alleviates, but as well, and in fact, a lot of times, uh, words is not so much about meaning, it's more about telling. And telling is a simple description, but not meaning. If I start giving explanation, giving a cause, then I have meaning. But if I simply tell, there is no, no meaning. Yeah, I agree. Okay with that? Yeah. yeah, I communicate the thing, but I don't give added meaning to the, to the event. Yeah? You good? Hello. Yeah, who's Hello, speaking? Hello, Denisa. Yeah. Denisa, can you put the camera on? Um, so we don't, we don't speak from a voice from in the grave. Yes, congratulations. Tell us. I would have a question about um, giving meaning. Uh, okay. If you can just uh, say to us some examples, I couldn't quite understand. Uh, I mean, I understood about like a punishment, that could be a meaning, but other examples? Well, uh, you see, for example, when you say, well, who would have an example for Denisa of counseling oneself by giving meaning to some pain? Yeah, so yes. let, let me go ahead. Uh, maybe karma will be a good uh, example. Uh, if you have a Failure, for example, you can say, oh, it's karma. I think I did something bad in my past. Okay. Okay, so, but it, it's a little bit close to punishment, but not exactly punishment. Do you understand, Denisa, the concept of karma? Uh, I, no, if yes, you don't, I would, you don't. I, would, I no. wouldn't assume it, it was related to meaning. No, Denisa, I'm asking you a question. Do you understand the concept of karma or no? I don't know. Okay. No. Well, if you don't know, you say no. You see, when you don't know, if you don't know, then no, I don't, okay. I don't understand. Who, who has another example of meaning? Consolation through giving meaning. Yeah, Isabel, go ahead. Uh, for example, someone has a very, uh, has an accident, huh? and he stay at the hospital for one month, and he starts thinking about it. So he said, when I'm going out of the hospital, I will do something with my life. So you give meaning to your pain. So it's a, it's a law you to accept it more and to give something. Okay, Denisa, you understood that one? Oh, yes. Yes, okay. Meaning is you make a connection. In this case, Isabel made a connection between you stay in the hospital unpleasant to something you will get from it, yeah? Okay. That's what we tell people, take your medication, they're not good, but you will feel better, you make connection. See, think of meaning as making connections to anything, and then the pain gets less because you connect it to something else, which might come out of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, good? Yes, thanks. Now this is a practical meaning, uh, Others are more uh, metaphysical meanings or they're different kind of meanings, but basically it means uh, you, 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 you connect to something else, all right? Anybody has a different uh, example of meaning as consolation? Yes, Shiro? Uh, like what we say, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Okay, so can you explain what, that, what is the significance of this as a consolation? Um, only by, uh, by giving meaning, just uh, saying it, something bad happened to me, but I didn't get hurt. I, I, I managed to survive. So the outcome is I become stronger. So you should give a positive meaning to something bad that has happened to you. Okay. Uh, here again, we have a practical result. Uh, we, we stick, but it's a form of meaning, is a practical consequence, yeah. 
good. Okay. If anybody has a meaning which is not a practical consequence, yeah, Leila? Uh, well, if I'm suffering, that, then I feel alive. Yeah, okay. So I give the meaning of being alive uh, okay. as part of suffering. Okay. Uh, you understand that one? Denisa, when you're suffering, well, you can tell, good, at least I'm alive. Yes, yes. Good? Thanks. Yeah. Are, are you in Romania? Yes. You know, in Romania, do you have the expression, it's better to get this, it's better to get this than to get a broken leg. You know, I don't know, you lose money. And somebody <laughs> tells you, it's better to lose money than to get... A yeah, broken yeah. leg, yeah? Okay, yeah. well, that, that, it might sound a bit stupid, but it's a form of meaning, yeah? Yeah? You connect this to not getting a broken leg, yeah? Mm -hmm. Strange logic, but that's the way it works. Good? Yeah, thank you. All right, okay. All right, good. So, on meaning, nothing more? Okay. So, uh, oh yeah, no, I was already past putting words. Okay, seventh is to give value to pain, to give value to pain, yeah? Now, of course, uh, right away, we can think of the, in the Christian uh, world, uh, value as pain for in itself, uh, starting with even God uh, was in pain uh, as a way to save, uh, but independently of the religious connotation, or we had it as well, uh, the value of pain given by the, uh, Nietzschean idea of Shira as well. Uh, when you have pain, it can make you stronger. Yeah. Uh, so when you have pain, or Father tells you, son, suffer, you become a man. Right. So the poor boy who's suffering from getting hit by his friends, Father say, you become a man. So you give. It's a form of meaning, but a specific form, where you give value specifically to the pain. Yeah. The pain has value in itself. Pain is viewed from now on as something positive. There's a transvaluation of pain. I mean, you shift the connotation of pain from negative to positive. So the valuing of, of, uh, of, uh, of pain. Anybody has another example of valuing pain? No? You know, so, yeah, Isabel, go ahead. Yes, I was thinking uh, when, uh, you know, in some uh, tribes or even in, yeah, when some kids, if you said, if you want to be a man, so you have to, to go through some different exercise. Right. And uh, typical and same, this value is so you become a man, you become an adult. Yeah, it's called initiation. And in, initiation. in, in, in most initiations, there is pain involved, yeah? Because uh, it's considered that pain has a humanizing, uh, as a humanizing value, yes? But as well, you know, uh, there's a, a pathology, a phenomenon where people make themselves sick. Uh, they literally, uh, not just an invention, they make themselves sick psychologically because through this disease, uh, they will have value, yeah? So being sick, uh, which is a form of pain, can give you uh, value because the disease has a valuing power on yourself. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, so let's move on. Okay, th then there is the reverse. There is valuing pain, then exactly the reverse, which is devaluing pain. When you're in pain, uh, you will devalue saying this pain is not important, this pain is secondary, this pain is insignificant. Yeah? You will take away the value from the pain. Well, let me see, who would have an example of how we console ourselves or someone else by devaluing pain? Taking away its value. Yeah, Shiro. Like vaccination. So you go under needle, but they will say the pain is nothing because it will prevent you from dying from measles. 
Okay, so you will take away the value of the pain, but there actually it's by giving, in a way, giving meaning. But in this giving meaning is true. There's a devaluation of the pain. But can someone have devaluation of the pain without in itself saying, Okay, I think everybody knows common expression where mommy will say or daddy will say, you have in pain, say, this is nothing. Just in itself, even without, uh, even without any promise or explanation, say, it's nothing. Which means in your head, when it, of course there is something. But by saying it's nothing, it means that your mind decides the value or the importance of this pain. Huh? And the person is inviting you to deconsider this pain, to deprive it of value or importance. In opposition to dramatizing the pain, you take away the value from it. Yeah. Okay, no problem with that. Yes, Marius? Exactly on what you said that uh, it's nothing, but in general, we say, well, you, you make a service that requires painful or quite an effort from your side, and then you reply, well, thank you. Well, nothing. There, there is nothing. Uh, there is nothing. The meaning that I didn't do anything special for you, it's sort of normal. It's not connected to a pain here, is it? An effort that, well, associated. Oh. I, I didn't. Normally, when you do something oh. like quite oh. effortless, and this is how it sounds like, yeah, oh. nothing. So we devaluate it as a, as a. Okay. I get it through, through the concept of effort, yeah, which implies pain. I say that pain of the effort was nothing. Okay, all right. From that from that angle, yes, I, I, I get it. Yeah. Any anybody else? No, we're good on that. Okay, fine. So let's move on to the other one. Acting, action. Okay, that's a big one. Um, one crucial way by which we, we take away the pain is by doing things. Doing things, yes. And that's a very common practice. Now, I'm not speaking about doing uh, in terms of because you want to do something. You go to work, yeah? But uh, the idea of finding yourself some activity, something where you have existential pain, uh, uh, which you're felt with your boredom, with your nothingness, and you're going to find something to do. It doesn't matter what. You can dig holes and empty them. You're not, you're not concerned with the production of something. It's just a pure acting, because otherwise you're facing with the pain uh, some existential pain. So action as a way to console yourself. Yeah. Does anyone have a problem with action as a consolation? No? We're good? Okay. Yeah. And that's a very, very popular one uh, where we are ready for anything that would make us do something, uh, no matter how insignificant, rather than facing ourselves. Uh, because here action allows us to avoid <clears throat> this very important pain of uh, contemplating the nothingness of our existence, which is a pain often ignored, but a very powerful pain. Yes. Okay, so. Okay, another form of <clears throat> consolation is retiring from the world, pulling away from the world. Uh -huh. Because the world is a source of many pains. Yeah? Uh, doing something in a way is more avoiding a personal, uh, intimate pain. But the retiring from the world is more connected to escaping the pain connected to the world. Uh, people are unfair. People are not, not nice. The world is whatever. It's cruel, right? So you retire from the world. That's what we do when we say, I'm going to go by the lake uh, where there's nobody or go walk by myself. And often nature is a, a place where we go to escape from the world, but it can be 
uh, to, to, to go in your room, lock yourself up uh, and watch TV, read books, whatever, but something where you escape from uh, the world uh, and uh, in a void, because the world means pain. Yeah. So, yeah. any comment about that? Consolation as escape of the world. Yes, Marie. Um, I'd like to know if uh, drinking habits falls under action or retiring from the world. Well, this one I put in the category that I'll have uh, called, I call excitement. We want excitement. Yeah, when you drink, you want some form of excitement. But of course, uh, but when you drink, you can drink. Often people don't like to drink alone. Yeah, most people, uh, I mean, some people, yes, they, they hide, they, they drink, they retire from the world when they drink. But it does not, it's not contained in drinking that you want to retire from the world. There's no quest for isolation. Well, you, you forget it in a way, so they can overlap in that sense. Yes. And what's the other one you proposed? Uh, action, doing things. Yeah, but action, you see, you're still, I mean, of course, you can do an action, but action, generally, you, you do something uh, with, often with the world. See, it's not intrinsic to acting that you withdraw from the world. Now, if you stay at home and pick your nose all day long because you retire from the world, <laughs> okay. But action, most of the time, there's still a connection to the world. Yeah. Uh, but of course, if you stay at home and do a crossword puzzle uh, all day long, uh, you say you're doing something. Okay, mm -hmm. fine. Yeah. But yeah. don't forget, like I say, some of these things overlap, but they don't overlap. They can, but they don't necessarily do that. So action is not necessarily retiring from the world. In fact, most times you're connected to the world and drinking, uh, they try to escape reality, but often people, they, they want to be with other people to drink. Yeah. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Yes. Anything else? No? Good. Okay, let's look at the next one. Okay, next one is to fabricate or modify reality, yeah? Now, this is a big uh, category because I would put in there, for example, an artist. An artist is unsatisfied with the world, so he's going to create a world of his own, be it a plastic artist doing painting or sculpture. Uh, even he, he makes a new world or he embellishes the world. He's trying to modify or make the world. Uh, but as well, somebody who's fighting for justice, uh, who suffers from injustice, is going to act uh, to change to change the world. So any any activity that has to do with changing or modifying the world, uh, I put in this category of consoling yourself uh, by uh, compensating. Uh, you get pain from the ugliness or injustice in the world, you're going to try to modify it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any problem or comment about this big category? No? Yes, Marius? Uh, isn't here actually included lying to yourself? Yeah, but then you're, I mean, it's, yeah, it's but then you're stretching it. I think you're stretching it because you're you're using more words here to, to, you know, to please yourself, but you're not modifying reality or you more a perception. So you can call it like this, but I think you're stretching it a bit because it doesn't have the objective dimension. But yeah, you could pull it in that direction as a embellishing of the world. Yes. Okay. Fine. Yeah. But you see um, when you, Marius, when you, take a category and you're stretching it, it becomes sort of another category, you see? Yeah, uh, but it was say, more going from fabricating, uh, fabricating. Yeah. And that's, yes. that's exactly what, what I call lying myself. I fabricate yes. reality just to, to create that, that yeah. comfort of, 
of through lying this, mice. This I would put more, uh, yes, you, I mean, you can oscillate, but it comes that through words, you're gonna please yourself, yeah? The question is how objective is your transformation of the world, see? An artist, he produces a product. Somebody wants to fight justice, he's gonna change society. So I meant here, actually have a, an action at does thing, not simply uh, please yourself, yeah? Yeah, I, I interpreted fabricating more like uh, uh, through a, um, more ironic, like you fabricate uh, stuff just to, to. Uh, I understand. I, but, but I, I misinterpret the, the fabricating. Right. Those categories is true. They're not very ironical. When you make categories, <laughs> they're supposed to be conceptual. When irony is trying to play on the putting together opposite things. So, yeah, yeah. Is irony. <laughs> Okay, fine. Anything else on that? No? Yeah? No, I... Yeah? Which one, Isabel, is on mute? Isabel, put the microphone on. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, I'm thinking about this last one because I, I will see two different, uh, two different things in the... It can be like uh, about uh, uh, people who want to make revolution. Right. So in that, in that way, it would be a consolation. That means to change something, to modify the reality of the world. But it can be as well for you said, like some people who don't like a uh, reality, they modify it, but for in, a, uh, in their own scheme. Yeah, but then the problem is that I have a further category, then it's more you go, I call it psychology or spirituality, where you modify yourself, yeah? So it's a bit different to modify the world and to modify yourself. I view it as two different things. Okay, all right. It, so it, 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 yeah. even if it's about fabricating reality, but it's a different level, right? Yeah, I view reality more as the world outside of yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But yes, you can modify yourself yeah yeah i put it sort of as if in fact you can tell because that would be an opposition between spirituality and, and politics for example in politics you want to change the world you know when in spirituality you want to change yourself right so here there can be opposition in fact some people in politics will say well what you're doing you change yourself so you don't have to change uh, the world yeah and on the reverse people in spirituality say well you want to change the world but the reality you should change is yourself so here yes it can overlap but still there are two different things okay. you're good yeah. and in fact that's what often spirituality and and uh <laughs> or and it goes up opposed to politics for example and that's why marx would say that you know religion is the opium of the people because yeah? it's it's easier to do something about your soul and, and work on your soul rather than working on society. Yeah. <clears throat> Good. Don't forget all these things, they have dialectical relationship. They can go together, but what I'm trying to do is things that don't, don't necessarily go together. Yeah. Fine. Good. Okay. Something else on this? No? Changing the world? No. Uh, but if you notice artists, there's a lot. You're trying to create a world on your own. because you, That's why it's called creative. Because you're not satisfied with the world we have. Yeah? Or minimally to embellish it. Yeah? Okay, so then uh, 12 is uh, human relation. Uh, uh, human relation is a classical way by which we console ourselves. Uh, if now, of course, you tell me some people when they're suffering, they prefer to be on their own. That's true. That's one way of being. But very often, when we when we feel when we don't want to share, uh, we want to share our, our our pain. Right? We're looking for people. Yeah. You know? Or even because people have the same pain as us, we feel better uh, through sharing. Right. Uh, it's the alcoholic anonymous principle. 
It's not simply about fighting the thing, but about feeling better about it because you have the impression you're not the only one having a particular, a particular pain. Or as well, I see, I know some people who are very addicted to going out with other people. They have their existential pain to be alone, their boredom, their feeling of nothingness. So what do they do? They look for friends and then they go out uh, and have a drink together uh, or go together to the, to the movies, right? Or it can be as well uh, looking for a, a couple, for a partner, a love partner, yeah? which of course has another dimension. But one dimension of it is uh, I need the other, I feel bad by myself, the other will give me value. Uh, and that's when you get even people that live through proxy, they live through uh, someone else, my husband, my wife, my children. Uh, I need other people as a way to console myself. Uh, uh, because through the relation, if I am... Uh, if other people look for me, I have value. By myself, I have no value. So relation as a way to uh, console ourselves. Anything about that? No? We're good? Okay. All right. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, 13 is passion. Uh -huh. uh, Spinoza has this, uh, has this interesting um, idea that you can only replace a passion with a passion. And what's nice is that passion has a, a double meaning because passion comes from patio, which means to suffer. But suffer as well means to undergo. So there can be pain or no pain. So if we have a pain, we'll try to find a passion that will make us uh, forget the pain. For example, if you have pain about something in your life, you will fall in love. And this love will be stronger than your particular pain and you will forget your pain. Yeah? As well, we see people who are passionate about something, about collecting stamps or whatever you want. Their passion of collecting stamps will make them forget the little pain, the fact their, uh, their uh, wife abandoned them yeah? because they, they're passionate about collecting stamps. Uh, I remember once... Uh, uh, a, a, an African philosopher who, who's passionate about Plato told me uh, my wife abandoned me because she said I preferred Plato and it indeed it seemed to bother him very much because his passion was Plato and his wife abandoned him was secondary to his uh, passion for Plato. So passion is something that consoles us when we find it and in fact sometimes we tell people you should find a passion uh, as a way to deal with the pain uh, or the nothingness of their existence. Uh, and passion is a good way to avoid nothingness. So passion as consolation. Any problem about that? No? No? We're good? Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, 14 is excitement. Okay. We look for excitement. Because one of the most crucial pain we have is, is boredom. And the, 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 the feeling of boredom is one of the worst feelings or the feeling of nothingness. It's very close, boredom and nothingness. Because in boredom, there's nothing, nothing interesting. Yeah? And uh, so people look for excitement. Uh, it doesn't matter what kind of excitement. Now here you see you can find passion as an excitement, but... I view excitement, I distinguish it a bit, uh, maybe in, the, in a certain way as a construction, you, because you're not going to say somebody's passionate about drinking, we say, is addicted, because we view something uh, pathological about it. But we look for excitement. It can be a product, uh, it can be a product uh, uh, like uh, alcohol or drugs, it can be an activity. Uh, uh, like like uh, gambling or today apparently um, uh, pornographic uh, addiction is getting apparently quite strong because of the easy access to pornography on internet. So yes, so it can have a, it's a form of excitement, uh, but it can be partying, it can be seduction, 
you know, seduction, the Don Giovanni syndrome. So uh, excitement, yeah. Now I say excitement because see, passion can be sustained. Uh, you can have a passion for philosophy or for nature or for collecting, so it can be sustained. Excitement in general uh, can, has a hard time be sustained. And you see people where excitement, you're, if you're excited about gambling, but if you go to a casino, uh, you will look at people and you will see more sadness than be sustained. Uh, excitement is stronger and stronger, but at that point it becomes very difficult. Same with drug addiction. Uh, uh, the excitement becomes more and more difficult. Either you produce boredom or you produce counter effect like cocaine, for example, you know, unlike drinking, you won't produce boredom, but you'll produce counter excitement, which you'll start getting nightmares or see horrible things and stuff like that. Yeah. So excitement is something that functions uh, rather momentarily, but after that starts becoming problematic. It cannot be, you cannot maintain excitement. Yeah, there are certain types of emotion, but still, uh, or people at less pathological form is uh, life is hard, but in the weekend I can go to the beach or whatever, right? It's a form of excitement. You know, I can get some, something more exciting because life is boring or life is painful. Yeah? So anything or people that live waiting for retirement, that's going to be exciting. Or we're waiting for holidays. Yeah. So excitement is a form of consolation. Any problem with that? No, nothing. Good. Okay. Or you're getting tired. It's almost finished. It's almost finished. Excitement. Okay, violence. Violence is a form of consolation. Yeah. Uh -huh. Now, it might not speak to you who are, <laughs> I, I see, uh, I imagine rather peaceful, <laughs> peaceful people. Otherwise, you would not be in a philosophy workshop. But for people, some people, especially, you know, in a, people in a very uh, deprived social environment, Violence is a fundamental, very important way to, to, to uh, console yourself from the difficulty in your life. Yeah? But as well, even in very educated people, uh, violence in, in the, at home, yeah? and violence against your, your partner, against your family, can be a way you console yourself. To be a little uh, family tyrant uh, is a way you can console yourself in the harshness of life, yeah? So um, violence can be actually ritualized, like in SM uh, sadomasochistic uh, practices, yeah? It's a form of uh, violence, it's violence, it's excitement, but still there's a violent, it's excitement, because excitement not necessarily violent, but is this violence uh, as a way, violence on the other, violence on yourself, uh, by the way. People who practice self-mutilation, uh, teenagers that have a problem, who, who hurt themselves, who cut themselves, who burn themselves, is, uh, it sounds strange, but it's a way to get some, uh, some excitement, yes. Anything about excitement? No? We're good? Okay. Okay. Next one is uh, life. I put together life and body. Uh, I don't know, you know, something where you go, uh, life is hard, so you go toward something more biological, like a life for the body. Uh, people that will either uh, the body as aesthetic, you know, I work on myself, make myself beautiful, uh, put tattoo on my body, put piercing on my body, uh, but do something my body, I take a lot of care of my body. Uh, uh, as a way of consolation. My, my, my mind is not so happy, but I'll take care of my body. It can be an aesthetic dimension of the body. Uh, I oppose that to beauty because you work directly on yourself. Uh, but as well, it can be working on your body, like doing physical exercise or uh, uh, taking walks. Uh, although here in long walks they can be your body but they can be as well a connection to nature but still it's a connection to life yeah 
And I put life here as anything biological, in anything that would be non-biological, that has nothing to do with immediate biological uh, activity. And for many people, nature indeed is the place that say, oh, uh, I say, what is good in your life when I go in nature? And when you go in nature is the connection to, to life. Yeah? So life as disconnected from uh, either form uh, psychological or form activity or form connection. Yeah. So body and life. Uh, I still have doubts that I should leave them together, but for now I put them together. Is a form of consolation. Yes. Any and today there are a lot of activities, uh, new type of self development of therapies that are very connected to. I know someone I went to spend a week where you just. With your body, you don't speak. You just connect to your body yeah. as a form of consolation. Yes. A lot of new age practices are, uh, are into that because they, they view the thinking as being bad because thinking is worried. So you connect to your body. Yes. Anything about that? No? No? Okay. Then next one, 17... Uh, is uh, the oh is about doing good or morality? Yes, being moral. Yeah. So life is hard; it's painful, but I'm gonna feel good because in all this, I'm gonna do good. I'm gonna be a moral person. Yeah. Or I'm gonna impose morality on people. Yeah. So morality, and that's what actually Nietzsche criticized, that through morality, you want to feel good. You want to be a good person. And by being a good person, you console yourself from the pain and evils of this world. So morality as a way uh, from, uh, for, for feeling good. Anything about that? No? Okay. Uh, and in fact, morality sometimes can even mean that you're going to suffer to be moral. And that's, again, we'll go back to the idea of finding, you create meaning for pain. But the whole point here is by doing good, by being moral, uh, you suffer less. 18 is religion. Okay, the big classic. Uh, why do we invent religion? Uh, all these religion. Well, because we... Because uh, to have a chaotic world, to have a world that has no explanation is painful, psychologically painful. To have bad things happening to us without being able to give reasons to it, without being able to give meaning to it, uh, without understanding it, right? Uh, think of the poem of Job, uh, where people try to give understanding to, to, to his suffering, right? So religion is a classical way by which we console ourselves. And as well, because they, they, there'll be a life after, for example, or life before. Yeah, that's, so religion is a very classical way by which we um, feel better. Yes. Uh, good. Anything there? No? It's rather clear. 19 is psychology and spirituality. I put them together because they're very connected. Psychology is from the suke, from the, the soul, uh, the science of, this, of the, what animates us, anima, what animates us. Spirituality is a more, it's in between religion and psychology. I put it on, on psychology because today a lot of the spirituality wants to be godless or religionless. Yeah? But it's basically all kind of techniques that are working on your soul, on your... Uh, and, and I will oppose it later to a reason, which is more cognitive. Those practices not so much about cognitive. They work more on the attitude, the way you, you relate to yourself, the way you behave, to be calm, for example, to work on the calmness, to work on the acceptance, uh, to work on... Yeah. It's not so much about producing ideas like there is in reason, but more how you relate to yourself. So psychology, and, and it can be 
Uh, it can be a purely therapeutic thing like in psychology where you have a patient, but it can draw what today is called cell development. It's more like gymnastics. It's like more gymnastics. Uh, like you would go to do gymnastics, you exercise uh, your, uh, your soul, your mind uh, to alleviate the pain. Yes. So any uh, meditation for me, I would put in this uh, category. Okay. So any question on psychology and spirituality? A comment? No? We're good? Okay. Then I have the last one, which I call reason. Uh, it's the activity of reason, which is what we find in philosophy, but it can take other form. But here, uh, the difference with spirituality is that you want to produce ideas, you want to use that to uh, understand the world. I mean, it can be uh, doing science, for example, except doing science uh, doesn't work so directly on yourself, but still. Uh, but any activity connected to reason, but it has to be connected to production of concept, production of explanation. Yes. So that's it. We went through the 20 categories. Um, I think to, as a very uh, subjective thing, I ended up with those three because I think these are the three that sort of works the best. I think the most efficient are religion, uh, psychology, spirituality, and reason. These, I think, are the most uh, efficient one. The, the one uh, which have the less drawbacks, the one that can be the most efficient, can be more self-sustained uh, by, by, by experiences. Others will have more drawbacks, I think. But anyway, but I'm not going to go into that. But I, if you want to do something, I recommend the, the last three. If you want to have a more efficient consolation, but it's a very subjective statement to end up with. Yes, so is there any comment or question on the overall idea? Yes, Marius? Uh, one quick comment on the 17, I think you said doing good. That's uh, the yeah, 17, yes, yes, morality, yeah. yes. Yeah, actually there is the opposite of doing bad and that's revenge, which is I think, I think a major way of, of consolation. We, yeah. we, we, we but use it yeah. really much as a yeah. consolation engine. Okay, but this I would put in violence. Huh? You, want, you want to hurt, right? So for me, it would go in violence. Yes, no, not necessarily uh, physical, any kind of I, I, revenge, just just you have the other one will, will suffer as well, sort of, sort of. Uh, you agree that revenge is a form of violence. I don't care if it's physical or moral, but it's a form of violence. You want to hurt someone. Yeah, but even if only like, I wish the other one, the, the neighbor goat will die. Okay, uh, but if you wish, yeah. Sort of consolation. But Marius, yeah. something you get a bit confused, you know that? Oh, yeah. Your revenge is an action, okay? Okay, you do yeah. something and you want to hurt someone, you agree? Yeah, and that's... Okay, and, and, yeah, it's violence, yeah? And yeah. violence can be moral as well. I, I, you know, can be moral or physical, it doesn't matter. Somebody who wants to uh, psychologically, uh, a boss that wants to psychologically torture his uh, the people, on his subordinates, and it's, it's, it's violence and he's happy of, of torturing. He has the power of, 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 of so revenge, something similar, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and, yeah. And, the, and then violence is permanent insatisfaction, which is not so much the case in doing good, yeah. Yeah, the consolation more it was about the other one will suffer as or will suffer as well or wishing the other one as a, as a consolation. That's saying that hope the neighbor's goat will die. Okay, yeah, but if you wish, uh, if you wish, you are into fabricating something with, with words, yeah? Violence is an action, then you, you know. Yeah. You invent, you know, and it's something else. You fabricate 
you know, what you call lying to yourself. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Something okay. else? No? Okay. No. Do you have any general comment on all this? You found your consolation? I don't know. <laughs> Are you raising your hand, Isabel, or no? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was waiting for some people uh, to raise their hands before doing it. So, well, Simon, yeah, I... made a, Simon made a vow of silence. It's forbidden for his religion to say anything. So, otherwise, he's going to go to hell. So, don't. I'm telling you, don't wait for him to say something. <laughs> so, Isabel, you uh, want to make a general comment? Yeah, I found uh, it very interesting because consolation usually you. I was. I think. Just something as something good, you know, you're going to do to console yourself. But there were also like some, uh, I would say, negative, more negative aspect, which can be used as consolation. And it was really surprising, you know, like about violence. It was strange for me at the beginning. Or when you talk about nostalgia, you know, like to think this stuff, you know, as more like something that... Uh, I uh, we say, um, forbid you to go, uh, well, I cannot speak any more English, but I mean, something that's going to forbid you to go ahead, you know, consolation, it's supposed to help you to go up, you know, it consoles you, but at the same time you advance. But some of them like nostalgia or violence, it's more like you, you regress, to regret, uh, to regress. Uh, I, I think that's because it's, it, it, it's a subjective statement, what you just made, you know? Huh? You know? All right? Because you can decide that you want to go to war, violent, yeah? Huh? You want to, to go to war, yeah? You're going to be violent. I mean, I don't see why that would be a regression. And I don't see why uh, when you're old and uh, you want to think about the good moments of your life, I don't see why you would call that regression. Why do you call that regression? Because you don't go nowhere with that, you know? Yeah, but, that, yeah, but that's because you want to go somewhere. So that means you are into action as consolation. <laughs> that's all it says, yeah? That means you're active and not contemplative, but it sort of more shows about you who you are, more than the objective dimension of it. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. yeah? I think to be able to view the past as still being present is a very beautiful uh, and powerful idea that you have known something beautiful and it's always there it's always present i think it's a beautiful idea no yes no it's this beautiful but to see it as a consolation well beauty is a form of consolation but but you notice here that your subjective dimension of your comment or no yeah Sure, you still uh, one minute before you you die, you'll still want to do something. <laughs> okay, why not? <laughs> if it's possible, yeah. Huh? But suppose you are in a wheelchair and you cannot move anymore. I recommend to you some uh, good nostalgic uh, moments. Otherwise, you're gonna really suffer. <laughs> but anyway. I don't wish you, but <laughs> yeah. No, these things, of course, some, I, I, I recommend the last three more than the, the excitement of getting drunk, you know? But sometimes when you had a hard time, go have a drink. Not bad, no? You ever knew this? When you had a hard time, you have a drink and That's some, right. uh, yeah, it's a consolation, right? Yeah, but the next day is terrible. So better well, do something. No. It's not because you drink that the next day it's terrible. It's, you, you have to know how, how to do it. Yeah? Right? Uh, so these, uh, it's very much... See, I think that's a key determination for the value of, uh, of, of, of consolation is what is the, their capacity of autonomy they give you? What is their... Uh, are they rather self-sufficient or, you know, can they maintain themselves in time? Yeah. And how much they involve the, 
the whole being or only part of it. Not for example, that people that run to uh, console themselves, well, they cannot run all day. You know, they have to stop running. So they can run uh, once a day and they console themselves one hour per day, for example, but the rest of the day don't. See, that's the problem. So here you have to see what is the permanence of this consolation, how much you can maintain it. Yeah? And same with excitement. And it doesn't mean you should not run. Why not? Yeah? But the idea is all these different, uh, all these different uh, consolation have their, let's call it the pros and cons. Same with the reason. Yeah? Reason if, you're, uh, if you have strong physical problem, I don't know how much reason can help you to not suffer. Yeah? So plus as well, you can negate your, your body. So there's no absolute consolation, but some, let's say, are more powerful than others. But they all have some kind of power. Yeah? You know? And even violence. Didn't you think someday that some person was really horrible, would get a punch in the nose, you would think, wow, that would improve uh, the ozone hole. No? <laughs> you know, we all have these violent impulsions and we think that would be healthy, no? Yeah. Good? Yeah, good, yeah. Okay. And Simon disappeared. Okay. Okay, fine. Anything else? Good. Well, if you guys have nothing else, you have enough now to console yourself, I hope. If you find a new consolation, just let me know. Otherwise, good. All right, good. So see you some other time then. Bye-bye.